Hello, hello, friends, and welcome to the Wisdom, Wellness, and Wealth monthly series brought to you by the Pieces Collective. Today, we discuss the heart of our culture, Black art and artifacts. We have some amazing panelists to help us uncover the meaning of these artifacts and what they can tell us about our past, present, and maybe our future. So let's first welcome Ikrama Muhammad, the Executive Director of the Pieces Collective, whose goal is to contribute to human development through experiential learning, economics, and education. Thank you for bringing us together, Ikrama. Hi, Rochelle. How are you? Doing good. How are you? Good to see you again. So I just wanted to say good evening to everyone and thank you for coming out this evening. And I hope that you and your loved ones are well. Uh, we are coming to the close of what is known as Black History Month. And so we give thanks to our ancestors, specifically to Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who started this tradition in uh, 1926, selecting a week in February because it included the birth dates of uh, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. In 1969, Black educators and the Black United students at Kent State University first proposed Black History Month to extend it to a month. The first celebration of Black History Month is recorded to have taken place at Kent State the following year. And ever since 1976, every U.S. president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. Dr. Woodson's um, reason for Black History Month was he was concerned with our knowledge of self or lack of it. Uh, he was concerned that keeping the knowledge of our rich and storied heritage from us was controlling our advancement. And in the miseducation of the Negro, he states, if you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his action. When you determine what a man shall think, you do not have to concern yourself with what he will do. If you make a man feel he is inferior, you do not have to compel him to accept an inferior status, for he will seek it for himself. If you make a man think that he is justly an outcast, you do not have to order him to the back door. He will go without being told, and if there is no back door, his very nature will demand one. So without knowledge, we often willingly or unwillingly perpetrate our own oppression. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History designates a theme for every Black History Month. I didn't know that. This is my first year uh, realizing that. But the theme for two, 2023 is Black resistance and states that African Americans have resisted historic and ongoing oppression in all forms, especially the racial terrorism of lynching, racial pogroms, and police killings since the nation's earliest days. And I know we have volumes of written work by our scholars bearing witness and analyzing the problems and presenting solutions. And yet some of these issues persist from voter suppression, miseducation, environmental racism, food insecurities, the killing of unarmed men and women at the hand of so-called authorities. So the question is, what else can we do? Well, there's a lot we can do, but one of the things when we think of Black history, we too often start with slavery, which means that when we measure progress, we compare it to slavery, Jim Crow, et cetera. And that's a very low bar. What if we compared our progress to the accomplishment of the kingdoms of Kush and Kemet, the mm -hmm. Songhai and Mali empires? What if our children and all children for that matter grew up knowing that we are descendants from the people who were the originators of art, science, mathematics, medicine, architecture, the list goes on and on. In fact, we are the descendants from the originators of humanity it's itself. As young people say, facts. All history is black history. And even if they won't teach it or they don't want it to be taught, it's our duty to teach it. So when we know who we are, and throw off the yoke of inferiority, as Dr. Woodson says, we can do at this time what we have been told that we cannot do, build beautiful, 
productive communities, build schools, and uh, produce education excellence, build businesses and collective economics so our communities can thrive and be self-determining. And that's not to say that we're not doing these things now, but we can be more all-inclusive and that can become the norm of when you think of our communities. Every day we should ask ourselves, what sacrifices are we willing to make and what actions are we willing to take to ensure full freedom, justice, and equality for future generations? In African villages, there are griots, and these griots keep the oral history and oral record, record for that village. They pass this information down, and it's kept generation after generation so we can stay connected to who we are. Art and artifacts are like our modern day griots which is why I'm so grateful that we have our panelists here tonight. And I wanna thank them for the generosity of their time and their willingness to share with us this evening. I'm very excited for this conversation. Again, I thank you for coming and hope you enjoy and benefit. Peace and love. Former Golden State Warriors forward Chris Weber is well known for his passion an all-star play on the basketball court during his time in the NBA. But what you may not know about Chris is that he has another passion, African-American art and artifacts. Chris has his own collection that tours the country to tell stories and inspire people to learn more about their past. My passion for history came from my mother. She's a teacher, and growing up in my room, everything that was in her classroom was in my bedroom during the summer. So growing up, I just loved history, whether it was the history of the 49ers in Montana or whether it was the history of uh, Rosa Parks in Detroit. So I just had a mother that really cultivated my love for history by just storytelling and um, just looking at the past uh, to how it affects today. So growing up, I didn't look at it as history, but uh, all the time she was prepping me kind of to, to embrace history. My favorite piece is from Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, she was a writer in the 1700s. Uh, she wrote a book, the collection, the poems by Phyllis Wheatley. And uh, I love it, one, because my mother is educated and a strong woman, and I know uh, how strong women affect um, this country, this world. And so uh, Phyllis had to write this book. She was a slave. She was taught to read by her slave masters. And I've read her book many times, and it's so beautifully written, and it's so complex. In sentences, I don't understand how she could have recited the whole book. And her story really speaks to boys and girls, especially when I go to school and I let them touch the brittle pages and you have to put on white gloves and it's only so big, but it's, uh, it's one of, definitely one of my favorite pieces. Martin Luther King, I definitely have works from him. In fourth grade at eight years old, I had to remember his whole speech and say it in front of the, class, the school in a play, put on a choir robe and try to use his inflection. I have a dream today. Martin Luther King has been someone that uh, has inspired me for a long time and thankfully I've gotten to know his son and his family and um, just the sacrifices they've made. You know, Martin Luther King, he's some of the hardest stuff to get and one of the most inspirational people to get, so I'm just proud that, um, you know, in some way I can show kids, you know, what his autograph looked like, what some of his works look like, what some of his writings look like, and hopefully that inspires them. The NBA should use Black History Month like they use every month to promote diversity. This is the NBA, baby. We don't, we care about the best ballers in the world. And come hoop with us, and we respect your work ethic, your character, the things that Martin Luther King talked about, the context of your character. We don't care what you look like or where you're from. I, I don't care what background you have, what color you are, these stories can inspire you. They're American stories, uh, they're world stories. They're not just stories of slavery, they're stories of bravery, perseverance. Hopefully uh, it, it inspires people of all colors and races because um, there are stories, and because there are stories, everybody collectively is something to learn from and to, and to move on to. Yes. Well, that was beautiful. And thank you, Sister Akrama, for getting us started, getting set in the mood. Black resistance, perseverance, joy, and art. I am excited for this conversation. And if you want to know more about the Pieces Collective, please remember to go to thepiececollective.org and subscribe to the newsletter. You can also follow the Pieces Collective on Facebook and YouTube, okay? So get to subscribing. 
Now, remember, you are a part of this conversation. So if you have any questions or comments while we're having this conversation, please put it in the chat and we will uh, shout it out, which will be exciting. So now that the tone is set for our conversation, let's welcome our panelists. Uh, first up, we have Tammy Lawson. Tammy Lawson is the curator of the Art and Artifacts Division at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, where she is the steward of a collection of approximately 15,000 works of fine art and artifacts dating back to the 17th century that reflect the history and expressive culture of the African diaspora. Lawson holds an MLS degree from Queens College Cooning, specializing in the preservation of cultural heritage materials, museum collections, and digital curation. She has been awarded the Bertha Franklin Fetter Award in Excellence in Librarianship. Thank you for joining us, Tammy. All right, and we also have Deirdre Harris Kelly, who is currently co-director of the Mayor Bearden Foundation, the nonprofit organization perpetrating the legacy um, yeah, perpetrating, sorry, the legacy of one of our greatest American visual artists. She offers a unique perspective on Bearden's work, being a formerly trained painter and niece of the artist's late wife, Nanette Rowan Bearden. Harris Kelly's own, own artwork has been published and recently shown in a solo exhibition at the Newhouse Center for Contemporary Arts in Snug Harbor, mm -hmm. Staten, uh, mm -hmm. Staten Island. Mm -hmm. And for the studio, Sorry, I'm hearing a little something. For the Studio Museum in Harlem's Winter 2018 Postcard Series. Her mm -hmm. entry, Playhouse Collage with Monk, 118th Street, highlighted Minton's Jazz Club. Welcome, Deirdre. Thank you. Hi, Rochelle. Yeah. Hi, Tammy. And, and the curls are, and y'all curls are popping. I see it, okay? <laughs> and I see that too. That's part of the introduction. <laughs> so, uh, Please welcome Kimberly Henderson. Uh, Kimberly Anise Henderson is a writer and curator based in New York City. Her work centers on genealogy and Black American lineages through archival photography and historical preservation, which includes facilitating digital projects for the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem. Her curatorial work is featured in the 1619 Project book and her forthcoming picture book entitled Dear Yesteryear will be published by Ooh. Penguin Random House on March 7th coming up in 2023. Ooh. So we're looking forward to ch chatting with you. Welcome Kimberly. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay. All right. Everybody's so impressive. I'm like, um, oh, ooh, and I'm just I'm just hosting. Okay. <laughs> I'm just here, but I'm I'm here with some heavyweights and excited to have a conversation. Y'all ready to, to chat with me a little bit? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. Yes. So I'm gonna ask some deep questions. We're gonna get into it. First of all, because I've been to museums and seen some interesting things. <laughs> I wanna know, <laughs> how do you even define art? Like, is anything art? You and that's for did. anyone who wants to. <laughs> Me first uh, on that. Um, well, you know, it, it's it's an age old question. What is art? Um, and in many cultures, art is not even a word. I mean, it's not there's not a word that means art. Um, and so I think it is something different for everyone. Uh, and what I like to say is that it's an experience. Um, it's something that creates an experience when you look at it when you see it, when you um, put it together in conversation with other work um, and other um, ideas that it's expression. Um, it's the literal expression that comes out of an artist. Um, and oftentimes it's something that we've never seen and it becomes realized in that way. Um, is, the, is the work that's in hotel rooms that are kind of put together in a mechanical way, art. I, I like to not make that distinction necessarily um, because it does create an experience. It is, you know, often they're done by artists, um, but they may not be well-known artists. Um, but whether or not it um, 
it manipulates and is a translation of an idea and expression, I think is the kind of art that interests me. So therefore in a lot of hotels, I'm not interested in the work, but it does hold a place um, in, in decoration. So it can open windows. It just depends on what it is. So I don't. I try not to discount. I try not to make those distinctions between art and craft, which is something that you know. Oftentimes, you know, if it's utilitarian, they want to say that it's craft and it's not fine art. Um, I think what a lot of museums invest in is considered fine art. It's it's fine art, in in a way that it has. Um, it, it's a part of the conversation about art and moving art, the progression of art forward. So, but that's a very good question. And whenever you're in a museum, that's what you should be asking yourself. Is this well, art? It's okay to question it. I've seen a boa, <laughs> and, I saw a boa uh, burned onto a iron before. And I was like, mm. <laughs> Yeah, but the is thing it, is, when when you're in museums that's their job is to tell you why you're standing in front of this this artwork or whatever it is um so that you can know the context and how you should be enriched by this work i mean museums are educational institutions and okay. that is yeah. their job to do so so a curator you know spends a lot of time you know, giving you words and labels and ways of looking at this object um, and relating it to to yourself or to others around you, your experience. So they create the experience. That's what cure. That's what curators do. They create an experience. Okay. Well, Kimberly and uh, Tammy, do you agree with this? Is this a, a, did Deirdre hit it on the on the mark? That's that's what uh, art is. They, I see them shaking their head. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. My answer was going to be human expression. So <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yours, you you had it, but yours is succinct. Human expression. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she said it in like twenty thousand less words. Yes. Okay. Uh, she's a millennial. She's, she, she she she's she knows Not how to really shorten did. things. You pretty much summed it up, except to say that. Um, you know, um, as opposed to decorative arts or mechanical arts, um, I feel that if the human hand is involved with it and it articulates an idea, um, then it's, I consider it art. Okay. Well, th now we have, we know that I, art is in the eye of the beholder and y'all have given me the definitions of how to go behold something, <laughs> right? mm -hmm. ways to look mm -hmm. at it. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I see we already have comments. Uh, Joanne said, hi, Tammy and, and Deirdre. Uh, Charlene said, black girl magic. You know it, what's up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Kimberly. So people are already saying hi to y'all and uh, involved in this conversation. And um, I was listening to your response, and you started talking about curator, uh, Deirdre. Oh, I need to know more about this. Ladies, what is a curator? Well, I'll go first. Um, so yeah. I'm the curator of the Art and Artifacts Division at the Schomburg Center. And the Schomburg Center is a research library. Um, so my curatorial duties are somewhat different than the curatorial duties of a museum curator um, in that a mu museum curator, as far as I'm concerned, um, is managing what I call a dead collection in a research library and specifically the Schomburg Center, our collection, which I say is living and is alive. Um, and I say that because we encourage engagement with the collection and you do not have to wait until we have an exhibition or a program to engage with the collection. You could be you, Rochelle, or little Tamika from down the street who um, is interested in Romeo Bearden, who's interested in um, Elizabeth Catlett and um, read a book about them or is doing a, 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 pa a paper about them, but they want to see the work. 
So they could call me and make an appointment and I'm taking it out for them. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be production. It's going to be the actual work. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. We, every day, anyone has an opportunity who has a library card to come to the Schomburg Center, make an appointment and look at anything that we have. The whole collection is for you. If you want to do research on Malcolm X and access his archive, you can do so. If you want to look at Augusta Savage's work, you can do so. so cool. If you want to look at um, uh, Van Disease photographs, you can do so. Anything that we have in the collection in the Schomburg Center has 11 million items. You can have access to it. You don't have to be special. You don't have to be credentialed. So in, in my in that, that's amazing too that we should just point out because you don't always yes. have access to things um, through museums. You know, like today I brought my class to to Tammy's division and I told them to get up close because that's your opportunity. Uh, to get that close, to get, you know, so close to the artwork that you can see some of the details that you wouldn't normally, you know, in museums, they, you know, the beeper starts going off, the alarms start going off, the, the you know, guard comes over to you, pushes you aside. So, yeah. you know, this is a, this is a rare and very um, important resource, um, yeah. that division. Yeah, yeah so we're it active. like it. Yeah, we I was going to say that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so we actively collect um, art and artifacts by um, buying about people of African descent. Anything visual that documents Black culture throughout the diaspora, we're interested in it. And we know that our people and people will be interested in it. So we um, try to obtain it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a, uh, I think that's a transformative experience for people to know that it's history is not just something behind the glass, right? It's not something uh, that we just, <laughs> we did it and then it's over with, mm -hmm. right? It's the experience of it. We're, we're, we're touching the past and the choices that we've made and the things that we've gone through and they still mm -hmm. live in us, right? Mm -hmm. The fruits of those mm -hmm. choices still live in us. So I, I love this work that you're doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this work is spearheaded so by the idea of Arturo Schomburg who's the founder of the Schomburg mm -hmm. Collection. Um, he's a Puerto Rican of African descent. And as a little boy in Puerto Rico, he was, um, his class was assigned a, assi uh, was assigned a paper to write something about your history. And they told him, little Oturo, we know you don't have any, so we'll find something else for you to do. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, even though he was only 12 years old, he began to collect any and everything that he could find on Black history because he knew that wasn't so. So the, his collecting ethos was to collect vindicating evidences is what he called it. Um, he wrote an uh, essay um, called um, uh, Digging Up, uh, what was it called? Uh, the oh, Negro oh. Digs Into His Past. Right, the Negro digs up his past. And what he's saying in that uh, essay is that um, not only are we collecting vindicating evidences, but that the Negro must look to his past so that he could see clear his future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. They have the evidence to uh, fight against the bigotry and, and the lies. Mm -hmm. uh, that are told to us. And he just collected all these different vindicating evidences. Mm -hmm. And the New York Public Library purchased this collection. And um, in 1926, when they purchased it, it was uh, 10,000 items. And now mm -hmm. we have over 11 million items. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, that, that's uh, oh, okay. I don't have no. Oh. No history. Okay, hold on. <laughs> right. Well, you know, Back it's it's, interest, it's interesting to use the term vindicating too, because um, you know, it's very much it was very much the project of like Alain Locke to sort of move the race forward through art. He thought that young people were going to sort of you know let the world know. I mean, it was it was it was a pitch for integration, but it was like letting the world know 
the fine art and what um, African or the Negro at the time was capable of, right? And so if they knew that, then therefore there wouldn't be this, you know, segregated um, inferiority um, about the, the Black race. Um, but that was a project to move the whole race forward. Um, and, and he knew that it would come from the arts, writing, um, um, visual art, and encouraging them to look at Africa, to look at your own past um, and bring that forward. You know, you have Picasso who's looking at African art. No, that's your art. You look at that and you bring it forward. And, you know, at of the time in the Harlem Renaissance, you know, black people were the ultimate modern being. They were doing the most hip shit. Oh, excuse me. Sorry, I don't need to curse. I can't curse on, on TV, can I? <laughs> Okay. But, you know, it's like just like today, usually, I mean, you know, they're looking to black culture for the hippest, newest, most modern, contemporary things, ideas. And so I'll just say I, quickly and then I'll let Kimberly true, speak. So. Yeah, I just wanted to say. And so when when we talk about curatorial practice, it's about arranging and putting those things in context and new contexts so that you can see these, these works differently. That's why, you know, we're still seeing the work of artists from the Harlem Renaissance. We're still seeing them in new exhibitions and we're seeing them anew um, because curators go in and they rearrange them, put them together or put them next to things that they will have a conversation with. So I'm sorry, Kimberly, go, go ahead. You, we're still on curatorial practice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, you both have summed it up very beautifully, in my opinion. I was just going to, if I have anything to add, it would just be that, um, you know, there's different types of curators, like Tammy was explaining. And, you know, in the gallery slash museum context, it is like Deirdre just uh, mentioned, it's telling a story. You're putting items together to shape a narrative for audiences to consume, to view, to appreciate, to question um to do all of those things so uh yeah i think the role of the curators is really important in um how people interact with archival materials artwork the whole thing yeah absolutely yeah. uh thank you for educating me i'm like what what's a curator do you like you didn't say go look it up my name's not google so i appreciate that uh and for the the nuance of the curator's job, depending on if it's in a museum or research library. Um, and, and Kimberly, you were you were talking about like how important it is. So I, I kind of want to talk, start with you with what are like some challenges to promoting and preserving black art, um, especially in this digital age? Um, well, so being the curator at uh, the digital curator at the Schomburg Center, it is my role to um, bring collections into the digital, into new digital landscapes. So specifically, I am looking at digitization. So that just means getting a digital surrogate of a collection item, a physical object and photographing it and, and creating a digital representation of that object. Um, mm -hmm. And this is not only important uh, for access, reasons of access, as we saw with um, the pandemic, it's important that while we might have to be remote or if we can't actually make it into the, you know, um, Schomburg Center, for example, or wherever the collections are, the museum, it's important that we um, share the collections digitally with audiences so that they can see the works. And of course, there's nothing that will take away the power of presence, being in the presence of the artwork. You know, if it's an oil painting, maybe you can smell some of that oil, you know, mm -hmm, medium. Mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing that's ever going to take away the power of presence. But with new digital landscapes and new digital platforms, we are able to share collections in ways that we weren't before. And I think it, from a preservation standpoint, that's really important because as we see in the news, sometimes there's cultural institutions, museums, archives that have fires and they lose whole um, collections of objects mm -hmm. and artifacts, which is tragic. But if there's a digital surrogate for those materials, then we can at least have a representation of what it was. Um, and the same thing when we think about 
uh, you know, preserving into the future, new digital landscapes that are going to be created that we don't even know about yet, that haven't even been thought about or conceived of. If we have a digital representation of an object already, then it's easier for us to translate that into other digital forms. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, digitizing is, is really important. It's not always easy. And of course, there's all there's layers of, of funding and, and, you know, access and, and staffing and, and all these various, um, you know, factors that may help or hinder an institution from digitizing. But uh, if you can do it, it's really important. Do you think we'll ever be in the like the metaverse of of uh, of going to museums and all the digital copies will like float around us? Do you think you that's know upcoming? We're sort we're of there. there. Yeah, we're, we're there, there with, the, with certain institutions and, and certain digital platforms. We can create virtual galleries and view artworks up close. Um, and again, I, I really just like to stress, even though I my job is is based in digital and in the digital world. Um, there's nothing that takes away the power of presence um, and, and engaging with collection items and artwork with all of your senses. Um, but again, you know, being able to access materials and view artworks in the digital world is a new thing that, that a lot of institutions and artists are, are um, trying to navigate. And, and um, for me, it's fun. So Yes, we can very we can very easily uh, see artworks in a virtual museum and it yeah. interact that way. <laughs> yeah, especially I think about that um, for people who may not be able, easy for them to travel, uh, things like that, like the difficulty of leaving the house that they would yep. still have the ability to interact with the art and artifacts. Um, that would be a beautiful thing. Yeah, and in many ways, it's leveling the field. Um, for young people to learn about the arts and to learn about other places because through the art you're learning about culture, right? Um, and so they can learn about cultures no matter where they are and they become cultural literate. Um, and that's something that we're striving for, I think. Maybe it, maybe it makes people want to go travel, right? <laughs> they saw it in the museum in, in, well, at their house, it, and then they're like, I need to see it for real. Yeah, and it certainly brings a different understanding to who we are as humans, you know, because I think that artists, um, you know, are, they're attempting to express what they are going in in their own time, right? And that's why they become capsules of time and space, um, you know, Romare Bearden, he, you know, started off um, doing a lot of um, urban scenes, but then later in life, he does start to look back to his Southern roots and he, you know, creates artwork that is um, about the rural landscape because he felt like it was disappearing. He'd go back and some of those ways of his folk were disappearing and he wanted to capture them um, so you get these some some of these very quaint, um, you know, images of a um, of family life um, in the '70s when he's in his studio in Canal Street. Oh, um, wow. So it's like it's it's using his memory and also wanting to have um, a record um, and document um, the life um, in which he was living. Oh, huh. oh, that feels so good. It's like a like a meal I, I'm eating here. I'm enjoying this. I wonder if this is a moment where we could show some of these images that we're that we're so invested in preserving um, and these artist um, ideas. Yeah. Um, so I just want to run through quickly some of our master artists. Um, you know, many of you probably know um, Henry O. Tanner, who was um, probably we could call him the granddaddy. Of, um, of black art. Um, he was born in 1859 and um, he was very interested in light and spirituality. And, um, and so you see, he did a lot of um, you know, work around this uh, scene here called the banjo lesson, which is very well known work of his, but um, he was very spiritual and religious. And so a lot of his paintings, um, you know, are about that. And I say grandfather because at the time that Henry O, you know, Tanner was, we say Henry O. Tanner, but Henry Oswald Tanner 
was painting, um, there weren't very many black artists um, on the scene. I mean, and he was working in very traditional methods. Um, but along that, you know, in, in this one slide, I need to also just call out names like Edward Bannister and Robert Duncanson and Edmonia Lewis, um, because these were all artists of his milieu. So if we can have the next slide, um, you know, a photographer. Um, and I chose many of these artists because I feel that they were invested in depicting their environments and preserving a culture and documenting. Um, and, and James Vanderdee Van was very well known for documenting um, um, political scenes, the middle class, black middle class style and culture. Um, and so on the left is a picture of Marcus Garvey, um, but he also photographed, he had a very successful um, business through the 20s and 30s and he photographed um, very famous people, Marcus Garvey, Joe Lewis, um, Frederick Douglass, and even um, Mich Michel Basquiat, um, who is an artist who um, had a very short life. He died when he was 28, but in 1982, James Van Der Zee photographed him, and now we have those um, portraits as a document. So it's important that photographers were on the scene and that they were working um, in Harlem to capture these scenes. Um, so go to the next one. Um, Romeo Bearden is a little out of order, but but um, he he comes a little bit later than another artist that I put in is Aaron Douglas. Um, we were just at um, the Schomburg today looking at Aaron Douglas's mural, um, the aspects of Negro life. And, um, you know, my students are blown away by the size of these paintings. Um, so, you know, Bearden is known for the block, born in 1911, and um, the block is a slice of Lenox Avenue. And we talked about that today, just Lenox Avenue versus Malcolm X Boulevard. And, um, but Bearden grew up on 131st Street. And so this was right around the corner from where he grew up. And between, nine, between 132nd and 123rd, 133rd and 32nd um, on Lenox Avenue. And, um, and so this is not only just depicting sort of all of the activity and things that were going on, the, this burgeoning life on the street, um, he also saw this in terms of the aesthetics, you know, the colors and shapes and forms being a kind of keyboard. Um, and this is made up of six parts and it, um, it lives at the Metropolitan Museum of art in um, New York. So we go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned in the 70s and 80s, Bearden goes back to his memories of growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I just do a little plug real quick because right now he's enjoying, his work is enjoying um, being in conversation with Picasso um, down at the Mint Museum that has probably the most Beardens on public display. And so they're putting him in conversation with Picasso um, because he's he's the I think I can say this he's the best biggest best thing to come out of Charlotte I should I probably shouldn't say that but they act like he is um, I mean they definitely we love you Charlotte um, <laughs> they they definitely honor him they but they pull him out a lot um, and they they built a park in his name so hey um, what can we can't argue so the next slide will be Aaron Douglas, which is, a, he's a little older than Romeo Bearden. And Aaron Douglas was very, very important. If we can move to the next slide, very important. I mean, if we can call um, Henry O. Tanner the, the grandfather of art, we would definitely call Aaron Douglas the grandfather of, um, of the New Negro movement. Um, and so his work shows up and becomes a sort of very strong, um, you know, graphic element, and it was used in a lot of magazines and journals that were going out to Black people all over the country and, in you know, telling them what it was like to live in the urban areas. And um, so Aaron Douglas was involved in Cubism. I mean, if you look at 
A lot of his forms are flat um, shapes, silhouette forms, um, and, and very charged with, you know, history. And, um, and he was, if you look at his work, he was being able to kind of lead that charge of um, Black art. Now, in the Harlem Renaissance, when Aaron Douglas, he was born in Topeka, Kansas, when he came, comes to New York, there aren't very many visual artists. In fact, when we talk about the Harlem Renaissance, lots of times they're not talking about the visual artists, they're talking about all the writers and the musicians at the time. Um, but he was there and um, he came to New York. He was on his way to Paris because that's what artists did at that time. They went to Paris to study and then he, he came and stopped in Harlem and that's where he stayed. Um, and so the next slide. Yeah, okay, I'll try to go a little bit quicker. Jacob Lawrence, um, you know, again, using a very flat style, um, which is in, um, which is um, a very modernist aesthetic, cubism, um, and Bearden used it, Lawrence used it. Many of them were inspired um, by this very graphic look in um, very simple forms and simple colors. But what Jacob says is that he was inspired by with these colors and forms of Harlem. Um, and he was famous for a 60 piece series called The Great Migration. And so these are two works from that. And, um, you know, they tell the story of Jacob Lawrence using the library, you know, and, and being um, there and um, getting this story out in a cycle, um, in a series. And then he also did a series on Harriet Tubman. He did a series on um, Toussaint Louverture. And so in this way, he is creating an archive. Um, and also, you know, I just want to say that word that Tammy used earlier about activating and not being, you know, not dealing with, with dead artists or dead art is, you know, an activation that has to happen. And like I said, a lot of these artists are enjoying exhibitions. Their work is enjoying exhibition now because they are being in conversation. And that is a sort of active um, way of talking about them. So let's just move ahead. I just want to go quickly through the next couple of artists. Elizabeth Catlett, born in 1915. So Bearden is 1911, wow. and she is born in 1915. Jacob Lawrence is soon after that, 1917. And so this is a group of artists who were there and benefiting from all of the work that Aaron Douglas and others were doing um, you know, in the um, early part of the Harlem Renaissance. And I can't, I can't not talk about so many of these artists, but um, Charles Alston, um, Augusta Savage, you know, Tammy could talk more about Augusta because she was very important teacher for a lot of these younger artists. And, um, and, but I put Elizabeth Catlett in here. She worked in a lot of different forms. She's known for sculpture, but she also did a lot of printmaking, graphics, um, really, you know, sort of documenting um, Southern life too, and also in a very modernist aesthetic. You see this, even this fist is done in a very sort of simplified, flat way, yeah. And, um, and Elizabeth, so um, she was, she also was married to a number of artists, but Charles White, and then later married um, Francisco, um, um, blanking on his last name, Mora, who was a printmaker also. And um, she went off and, and lived in Mexico um, for some, quite some time, but she um, always kept this aesthetic. She died in Mexico, um, but she was born in Washington, DC. And so we go into the next one, um, Faith Ringle. I have her in here. If you know, it, it, Hey, she is 92 years strong. Um, and so we only have, I only put in two living artists, but Faith is definitely someone who um, was very interested in capturing her environment. She was born in Harlem. So she really benefited from the rich environment of the Harlem Renaissance, um, born in 1930. Um, and, you know, she is known sometimes for these, the um, story quilts 
Um, this on the right is a part of her Tar Beach series and um, where she's actually talking about what her family used to do and where they used to hang out on the rooftops of buildings in Harlem, very specific to Harlem and specific to New York. But then a lot of people don't realize that Faith was also um, you know, working very provocative paintings. Okay, we're gonna move along. Very provocative paintings. Um, the one on the left where the stripes spell out the word nigger. And then finally, Carrie Mae Weems, very contemporary artist, um, you know, was working through um, ideas of racism, sexism, known for kitchen um, table series, but also was the first African-American woman to have a solo show at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Okay, that's it. So I just wanted to give us a context for what we're thinking about, the kind of objects that we're preserving um, and the artifacts that we're talking about. It's not just artists' lives, but it's the art. Yeah, so I yeah, just want to jump in here. Thank you for sharing it. Know. I just want to jump in here and let everyone know that all the work that Deirdre was showing you via the slides, you can call me up and I will take the work out for you to see it. So many of those, and this also is going to tie into the work that Kimberly does. Many of the works that were on the screen are in the collection at the Schomburg Center. The Aaron Douglas murals are up and you could see those that Carrie Mae Weems um, image um, recently came into the collection. That's in our Malcolm X uh, memorial exhibit that we have up right now. So you could see that. But uh, many of the other works, uh, Elizabeth Catlett is in the collection, of course, Bearden's in the collection. Um, you can also go to the New York Public Library's digital gallery and type in any one of those artists' names. And if we have it digitized, then you could see it and access it that way as well. And so that's how uh, Kimberly and I um, collaborate together. We um, identify collections. Uh, she does the due diligence in terms of copyright and what have you. And then we um, present it uh, to the library and hopefully they they agree, and then we could move on um, to having the actual work digitized. Mm -hmm. All that mm -hmm. stuff that you're just talking about, anyone out there can have access to it and, and see it. It's You don't have to be special. You could see that it is a true mm -hmm. blessing. Mm -hmm. And we have mm -hmm. comments, we have people talking, they want they want answers. They're listening <laughs> to this, they're like, mm -mm -mm. they got hungry. You, you feeding them. Thank you. First of all, Sister Akrama says she loves the Black Unity uh, piece. So we all really need a picture of our mm -hmm. fist up mm -hmm. so that we can be in some artwork too right there. Uh, that was beautiful. Um, also, uh, Deirdre, what is the dates for the exhibit? With, the uh, dates for, oh yes, um, it is up now through May, through May. May 31st, I think. Yeah. May 31st. <laughs> May 31st, yes. Um, the Mint Museum has a larger show of Picasso's landscapes. This is a 50th anniversary of Picasso's death, so you'll see a lot of stuff about him. Um, but the Mint Museum was lucky enough to be the first on a, a U.S. tour of the landscape show. So that And, and they have the Beard and Show right on the same floor. So oh, it is It is really a conversation. conversation with that. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And now let's take this co uh, question from Charlene. Thank you, Charlene, for asking the question. The question is, how has our story as Blacks in the diaspora changed through artistic expression historically? Mm -hmm. Are you telling or saying the same story? And that's mm. for anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How has it changed? And are our stories different? Or are we telling the same stories? No, well, we're, well, we're always trying to, to progress. Um, artists have a way of articulating what the future can be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also showing our best face. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're asked to do that. Sometimes um, that's, the, that's the charge, like um, when Elaine Locke um, and during the Harlem Renaissance period um, 
that was the charge to black artists to look to Africa, not to Europe, and to show black people that we have a lineage to look at, to, to go from, and also to show positive images to combat the derogatory images that proliferated um, even to even right now, but especially back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, you know, so sometimes that was the charge and a lot of artists did do that. That was um, a service to our people. Mm -hmm. um, but artists are individuals and um, um, they learn um, differently. They, they're working in different styles. Um, you know, different teachers, they're from mm -hmm. different parts of the country. Um, so, um, you know, there will be stylistic um, differences. Um, and I think um, as time goes on um, and people have more money, access to uh, more schools, access to travel, um, they are, um, artists are broadening um, their subject matter and and their styles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you yeah. this then: Do you think that black artists or e e even curators, like the people that are, are are working directly with that with our artwork, have kind of like a duty to say something positive or to like highlight uh, the good? You know, because there's a there's a conversation there, right? Your art has a, is is a conversation piece. Maybe you, for instance, uh, I know Alice Walker as a writer was pushed to show, you know, that she wasn't showing good enough images of like black men, right? And so like in, in art and then when putting together, maybe like curating something, do you feel a pressure that it, it needs to look a certain way or it needs to give a certain feel? I will say as an artist yeah, that that is something definitely that artists um, were struggling with in the Harlem Renaissance, um, you know, this, this idea that they are doing work in the style of some of the masters that they might have studied um, in art, and they were white masters, you know, white um, artists, European artists, but yet they're being asked to move the, the, the dial and to depict um, their own environments and try to bring the race. And so there's always this I think struggle um, between artists wanting to express themselves, but also just wanting to do their own thing. I mean, and, and then oftentimes, I mean, when you think about now, you know, we don't even see half the artwork that's being produced because there's a particular conversation. Um, let's take the conversation of black identity you know, that is the central conversation. And then if you're in your studio painting flowers or landscapes or whatever, you may not even get to be on that stage. Um, and so that that's a constant pressure for artists on wanting to be a part of the conversation, but also wanting to just have a certain freedom in yeah. what they get to express. And, um, and what I will say is, uh, is over the years to Charlene's question is, I do think that part of the thing that artists have been able to do is give us a diversity, um, a diverse um, array of imaging, right? So you talk about positive images that combat the negative images, but there's a lot in between, right? And so giving us all of ourselves in many different ways is something that artists, the contemporary artists have been able to do um, because they haven't had those same pressures. You know, as the years have gone on and we've learned more and more and it's always new. We see something we didn't see before um, because artists are constantly adding more views and more ideas about how to even make a figure, how to build a figure in a painting. You know, Bearden yeah. said, okay, I'm gonna take it apart and I'm gonna add part of an African mask and I'm gonna add, you know, part of a, a, a tree and I'm gonna make that be the part of the person so that he could show the depth and how black people are hybrid in terms of their mm -hmm. culture, that we come yeah. from a lot of places and we have a lot of people in us. 
Um, and so that was his, that was the way that he transformed collage. Um, and so he showed people, I mean, I'm sure at first people were like, those are ugly. Can he draw? What's wrong with him? He can't, <laughs> the eye is too big. The hand is too big. And then it doesn't match up. And then after a while, it becomes a language that we're used to seeing and we're using, right? Cause we get, we get comfortable with this idea that we're made up, that we can be made up of many different things. And we definitely are, right? We are made up of many different things and mm -hmm. honoring that is part of honoring the whole, the culture that we, we built. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we're gonna, if we're gonna show it, we don't wanna show just, <laughs> this is us. Mm -hmm. Cause we're, we mm -hmm. know that we're so mm -hmm. much bigger. Um, mm -hmm. Sister Krama had a question. How does the commercial aspect of the art world impact the black art culture? Oh, that's a that's a whole nother that's a whole nother webinar. Come on. It really <laughs> that's, that's, that's oh, wait, no, word. Kimberly gotta do the two words. Can you can No, you I can't I, I don't have two words for that one. Uh I do not have two words for that one. Having worked in a commercial art gallery, um being black in a white owned art gallery with majority white artists and, and, you know, me trying to do the Lord's work of including more black artists. I, I was as a curator and, and as a person who was working on the administrative side of a commercial art gallery, I saw firsthand how buyers interests really influence the, the market and the way that um, gallerists will select artists for their roster and who they show in their gallery. Um, it's, it's, you know, in this specific aspect of the art world, it's based on sort of the buyers and, and how to keep the lights on for the gallery and kind of more of a trend based what's happening in the art world. What are other artists doing? Like how are, how are galleries leveraging these art practices? collective art practices and trends to then sell work. So I think when you um, look at race dynamics in the mix of that, I think one of the reasons why the Schomburg Center has such a beautiful thing going is because the artworks that are collected are not based on any commercial aspect. They're based on, um, you know, really trying to create a collection of treasures that we see as treasures, how we see ourselves and how we are choosing to collect um, and, and you know, share our voices. And so I think um, in the, you know, contemporary commercial art spaces, oftentimes a lot of black artists are left out of that. And it's about who you know and, and all these other factors that don't have any um, or much, um, you know, connection to merit and an artist's, you know, skill set and, and whatever else. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's tough. The commercial art world is tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like something I, I shouldn't just jump right into, huh? Mm. <laughs> y'all gotta, no, I, mean, gotta uh, I mean, I'll just say when we're talking about the pressures on artists, you know, that's a whole nother, like I said, a webinar, a class, a whole year on you know dealing with those ideas and and so the the good thing about you know a place like the Schomburg again is that you're looking at artists who are um you know I think Tammy said that you know at at any level that they can donate their work they can um that you can come and see it art from all over the world right and so it's it's not just what one curator decides is the story you know even with museums and i make those distinctions between a gallery which is purely commercial venture right where you will see price lists museums are not supposed to be there right but when you think about who gets in the museum there's a little bit of a like connection to the um, commercial aspect of it. And so, but then again, it's about, you know, uh, who's curating it, who, what, who's directing the museums, who's at the table of these acquisition funds. You know, that's why I say this is a whole nother webinar because, you know, you got to follow the money, right? <laughs> and then it ends, up, um, it, it ends up not really being about the art. So uh -huh. that's why this is a this webinar is about the art and artifacts and um wow. yeah 
I think that part then I think that leads me to the we were talking about curating and we have you uh you you all on the line who all do curating work. So I kind of mm -hmm. want to know can we talk about like how does that work? How do you manage the art you're preserving, Tammy, or can you tell us about a project that you're working on right now? Mhm. Mm yes, sorry. Um, so it, the work never stops. I, I do so many different things um, throughout the day, being that we are a public, a public library. But one of the things that um, I'm charged to do is to um, preserve the collection and, um, and at the same time, make it accessible to the public. Um, so one of the uh, projects that I just finished doing with Kimberly is um, digitizing um, a collection of artist invites um, that um, an artist, Michael Cummins, donated um, to the Schomburg Center. He donated 40 years of artist invites, which are postcards and brochures and pamphlets um, of Black art shows, um, mainly in New York, but um, scattered around the country. Now, this in information, although this is um, uh, ephemera, which is um, something that's supposed to be used, you know, for the day to make announcement, it's a historical piece. Um, a lot of these artists um, we may not have known about, a lot of the galleries we may not have heard of. They may no longer get um, exist. Mm -hmm. A lot of the curators, it gives a, a history of art, artists, and even um, um, exhibition spaces that Black artists show, have mm -hmm. shown at. So um, working with Kimberly, it gave, it gave us an opportunity to have these, these um, um, artist invites um, digitized. Um, from that, um, our metadata specialist at the New York Public Library, metadata really is information about information. And what um, they've done is um, created a, a, a linked data project. So the images, the postcards were photographed and digitized. Then each curator, each artwork, each artist, each gallery, then got an entry um, in, in Wikidata, which established them um, in, on the internet. Um, this also gave an opportunity for um, Google to make um, knowledge pads um, about these artists and Siri can use this information. So um, I think Kimberly could speak more about it on the digital side and also has um, a few slides about yeah. data. We can share the slides um, just to give you all some visuals of the project that we are currently working on. So um, the Wikidata project that Tammy just introduced is based on the Michael Cummings African American Art Event Ephemera Collection. And like she said, it is um, nearly 1,000 ephemeral items over 40 years of exhibition pamphlets, postcards, flyers, brochures that has information about artists and exhibitions and galleries um, that happened from the 70s to early 2000s. And after we digitized this project, we decided to work with our metadata specialist team to uh, create Wikidata entries for these artists. So on the next slide, I have a few visuals of what that looks like. Um, so basically of the, so out of this all, nearly a thousand uh, item collection, we digitized uh, roughly a hundred of those pamphlets, postcards and brochures. And with that digitization, um, which was the images on the previous slide, now we have taken that information, worked with our metadata services and they are creating Wikidata entries. So basically the information that informs Wikipedia and Google and other linkable searches of the of those 100 that we digitized, there are 500 new Wikidata entries of artists, galleries, curators, exhibitions themselves, um, 
uh, you know, galleries that are no longer in existence. And of those 500, at least 290 of them were not previously represented online with their own entry. So that means that if you were to Google, let's say an, a gallery, a black owned gallery that no longer exists from the 1980s, you're now able to see that side panel on Google where it has the information about that gallery. And before this project, it was not previously represented. So these are the kinds of digital projects that I really try to push forward because not only are, is digitization important to have a digital surrogate of these materials, it's also important to make sure that people are able to access them as resources. So now someone searching has a linkable opportunity to you know, find more information about these artists and galleries and, and curators that um, once were working and, and some of them still are working. Um, and it's just important. It's a huge resource, a huge um, opportunity for us to share this information more broadly. As we were saying, you know, black artists um, are not always included in the canon of art history and just, you know, contemporary arts. Um, in you know a really as much as some other artists are and so uh this project really helps to bring them into conversations as far as research and and being able to really um access this linkable data and access i just say oh tammy i'm sorry go ahead tammy. oh i was going to say i wish that that link was live if you could just put it up again just to mm -hmm. show you not just um the information that we're talking about but each of those little lines there, um, it say it's like an encyclopedia to itself, itself. So this is all linked data. So in the middle, it says Lois Maylou Jones. You can't see it, but that's Lois Maylou Jones. And all these lines that are linking out, each of them means something. One could say her um, influences. Another one will say the art movements that she's related to, um, who, where she went to school, who she taught. And then with each of these little lines that are coming out, it links out to other artists and their connections. So you get like a full, I mean, it's so much fun. Like you could really um, geek out with this, but it, it has so many, um, so much linked data. Um, how artists are related, how institutions are related, how schools are related, what art movements they came from, who they were married to, all different types of information just by clicking on the links. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like a like a wealth of information at your fingertips. Yeah. This I have this to becomes echo, uh... Let me echo Charlene on this one for a second. Wow, amazing history. Okay, <laughs> we are in a grand. This is this work is amazing. You are like putting people on the digital map, right? <laughs> so they can be seen and and uh -huh. and recognized for what they bring to the to this world. That's beautiful. And I'm yeah, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to see that the Schomburg is doing this. We are involved in our own digital project um, with Romeo Beard and. Um, if, if, if you know about artists, if you've ever done research on artists, you look for what's called the, the catalog resume, which is the ultimate catalog of any artist. I mean, there's one for Jacob Lawrence, but that's about it in terms of black artists. There aren't other catalog resumes, um, comprehensive catalogs on where all of their you know, unique works are. And so we have been collecting information for 30 plus years since Nanette Beard and started the foundation. And we finally uh, partnered with um, the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, which is building our catalog resume as a digital catalog. And it's using all of the information that we have from the archives to make that sort of multi-dimensional, um, you know, capsule of, you know, where you can press a button. It, it's not as fun and, and pretty as that as you all, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very, um, you know, active, that's what we wanted was, um, you know, cause lots of times when you do these definitive guides, these catalogs, they're, you know, big, beautiful books, but once they're pressed and published, you can't make mm -hmm. any changes. And we now know, and uh, particularly with an artist like Bearden, a lot of different work comes up, you know, different research is, is developed and found. 
and all of the times. And so it's able to be a living, breathing document. Um, but this is so important. And, and the idea of the um, flyers and invites, oh, that is so crucial. I mean, when I think, when I talk to the um, archivists who are working on the catalog, they're looking at photographs of, you know, shows that people took, like exhibitions, you know, and looking for the people who were in the room, or they're looking for the list of works that may have been on a flyer, or may have been, you know, or the dates, you know, when you, they weren't dating a lot of these flyers, but these invites would, would are pieces of information that bring it all together. And so you can put certain works into order. And that's, you know, that's just a, a great thing. I remember we did a program with Camille Billups and, um, and her husband, um, and they had been collecting and they had an archive. I think it's since, since their death has gone down to um, Emory University to be that catalog. But she was collecting artists and she was going, she was an artist herself. So she was going to exhibition openings, taking pictures, writing down, and then she would exhibit artists and she would capture them on tape. Um, recording these interviews and pressing them into books, um, volumes of, of this series that they did. So those are all ways in which artists are involved in the archiving um, of yeah. history and their own, their own histories too. Jacob Lawrence was alive when his catalog resume was being done. So he could say nay, yay or nay, or this is here, or this is there. And I did this and I did that, which we, you know, you know, you know, yeah, um, we're we're work we're working with um, what we have saved and and what we can find now um, to piece it together in the history. Okay, well, tell me uh, about uh, Tammy. Could you tell me about the Augusta Savage project? Mm -hmm. so we're piecing some stuff together. I want to see how this pieces together. Right. So, um, Augusta Savage is uh, one of the uh, heavyweights who is um, heavyweights of the Harlem Renaissance. She is um, such an important artist on so many levels, but um, she has not um, been um, examined and given her flowers um, in her lifetime or now, but I'm going to make it happen for her. But Augusta Savage, um, was an artist from um, Florida. She came to New York in the 20s. Um, she um, went to Coop, Cooper um, Union. She got a, a free, well, it was a free school, but she um, got her bachelor's degree in three years instead of four. Um, that's how advanced she was. She was a sculptor. Um, she won a Rosenwald and a Guggenheim Fellowship to study in Paris. Um, when she came back um, to Harlem, she opened several um, schools in Harlem to teach um, artists. Um, there's no artist in the 20th century who has taught more artists who went on to become famous, who have paved the way and given um, these artists jobs and um, supported them. She had several schools. She little Jacob Lawrence was her student. Um uh, uh Morgan and Marvin Smith, Selma Burke, Norman Lewis, Charles Alston, who was Romeo Bearden's cousin. He was her associate director in the Harlem Community Arts Center. Um, so she taught these these people at the Schomburg Center, by the way. And uh, they came to Harlem, Ernie Krishlow's another artist. Um, they were taught by her. And now this is during the Harlem Renaissance. So we're talking um, before the Great Depression. Once the Great Depression happened, then it, we went into the WPA period. Um, being that she was all, already teaching and advocating for these, for these um, artists, um, when the WPA came around, she was the uh, director of the Harlem Community Arts Center. 
And she also was a founding member also with Mr. Schomburg, Romeo Bearden, Norman Lewis, and quite a few other artists in the um, um, Harlem Artists Guild that fought to have uh, Black artists on um, the WPA project. So um, Charles um, Spinky Alston was made the director of the mural project over at Harlem Hospital. There's still several um, uh, murals there. Aaron Douglas murals are at the Schomburg Center. Norman Lewis then became um, an easel um, director of easel painting. Um, and all these artists that she taught then um, fought to have um, them teach and become directors. She was like, a, um, she made a way for them. But um, I had an opportunity um, last year to participate, um, to collaborate with um, Marilyn Nelson, poet Marilyn Nelson. And we did a YA book that was um, published by Little Brown called Augusta Savage, The Shape of a Sculptor's Life. I wrote the afterword. And this is a young adult book in verse about Augusta Savage. So it's in poet poetry, but it's about her life um, from Florida all the way through the Harlem Renaissance and, and beyond. When she left Harlem, um, she moved to um, Saugerties, New York, where she continued to teach, but she was working um, as a lab technician up there for the most part, but she wrote books, um, she wrote poetry, and she continued to make art and um, sculpt and, and teach art as well. And she was up there. Wow. Um, let me, so first of all, I love that you are like, oh, she gonna get her flowers, okay? <laughs> right? We're going to see this. Um, so I'm gonna kind of put two of the questions together because we got so much interest. One is, where can you get the book about uh, Augusta Savage? And then in general about like um, our public schools and education or how are we sharing these opportunities with in public education or how are people getting, can get to you? Yeah, well, we have um, the, the, the book is being sold at the gift shop in on Amazon and it's in, you, you could probably check your local library. I'm sure it's in there. Um, it's in several um, um, libraries um, across the nation. But um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of your question? Oh, so another way how we are um, getting the information about our collections out um, is by doing um, research guides or lib guides. And I sent, I think I have a link to um, an Augusta Savage lib guide that I did that the New York Public Library published. And these guides are like um, electronic pathfinders so that um, for a lot of subjects or in particular, uh, this lip guide on Augusta Savage will get you started. If you're interested in her, I break it out to let you know that we have the largest collection of Augusta Savage work in a public institution. I have it listed, the works that we have of hers. Then you could click on the photographs and prints division. You can see that we have an Augusta Savage portrait collection, and she's in several other portrait collections um, in the photographs and prints division. Then I list um, several books by... Um, that she's in or that are about her. And um, what else? Then there's um, some audio or some movie or documentary film on her in our moving image and recorded sound division. So these lip guides that we produce at the Schomburg Center um, are electronic pathfinders. You could just do Augusta Savage lip guide and it'll get you started. It'll be a little biographical information about her and then books and other resources that you can access to learn more about her. Very cool. So what you're saying is you've been working, huh? <laughs> well, um, in Have terms of, and what I'll say about Bearden is we, of course, there are many, many, um, you know, catalogs from shows uh, he was born in 1911 and died in 1988, so he did a lot of work, um, and there are a lot of exhibitions, several retrospectives, um, and so you can find those books. There have been two, there have been three bios on him, um, Mary Smith Campbell, 
um, did a wonderful um, biography of him. Um, one of the early, earlier biographies are wonderful to actually um, see or hear um, interviews transcribed in the, in the book. It's by Myron Schwartzman. It's one of the early, early biographies. But in terms of access, this is what the catalog resume will be beautiful too, because it will be published online free to anyone who wants to do research on Beard. And this is the way that we are making our resources, all of the things that we've collected, information about individual works, art, his own life, his own writings, how we're making that accessible to the public online. I mean, all of our program is, all of our programming is free and accessible um, as well, I should say, um, for the foundation. And, you know, what we do is we feel like we are perpetuating um, his legacies, both artistic and um, intellectual, because he was a writer he wrote songs, he did a lot in his life. Um, and so we're trying to put it all together and, and give it away, <laughs> um, give it away for free. And, and the digital platform is what's allowing that really wide assess, access to accessibility to happen, <laughs> access, accessibility. Um, so that's so what important. we do. Also, I should mention that we did, um, we did uh, form a curriculum, a K through 12 curriculum based on Bearden's life and art. And it's called Bearden in the Classroom. And um, it's in a book form uh, and it has a CD of images and it comes with many posters. And that's something that teachers can still use and they can still buy on our website. And um, we go out and we do educational workshops um, with a lot of young people. Um, in fact, this week, I'm going to be um, down in Maryland doing a workshop um, with, well, doing a talk. We'll, we'll see what happens because it's a large group. It may be a workshop, but it may be too large of a group. Um, but I'm talking about Bearden, um, of course, for Black History Month. But, you know, this is what we try to do is, is get the word out and get the resources that make resources that they can access. Wow. That is so awesome that it makes me uh, <laughs> have to ask this question. Like, okay, so how do you, how do we get involved? You know, how do we get involved with arts and arts preservation as a career? Like, what made you get into it? I I want to know because by the way, I saw when y'all start looking at the metadata, everybody's eyes lit up. Like, ooh, <laughs> ooh. I know. I saw y'all all geek out for a moment. It was beautiful. So so tell me about how how do we get in this career and what brought you to it. First of all, you got to love it and you're not going to make no money. <laughs> Except I for know. me. Except for me and Kimberly. <laughs> but <laughs> the Roman done Bearden done. Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Um, so you can donate um, and you can show um, your appreciation of the work that we do. Like I say, you know, our, all of our programs, our public programs are free. To, um, to anyone. And, you know, it, a lot of it is geared to mid-career artists. Um, it's part of the legacy of Bearden in the Cinque Gallery um, that he started back in the 60s. But also, um, you know, you can, um, you can get involved by reading about these artists and studying them. And you will you'll get as excited as we are. Um, about these artists and and use the resources that are out there um, and to, to you know and to create programs like this where we get to geek out and we get to talk about what we like to talk about all the time. Um, so that those are ways that you can get involved. But you can go to um, beardenfoundation.org and make a donation. I think you can also donate to the Schomburg too because um, we need we need those dollars to keep doing what we do. No joke. You do. Yeah, I think I they were all sitting at the table. What, what you can know? you do? I, <laughs> Go ahead. Career wise. Oh, yeah, okay. Career wise. <laughs> oh, okay. No, she was like, but but career. Uh, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> my career is bring the money in. Okay. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> um, uh, but career wise, yeah. How do we? How do you get into it? What brought you to this particular career? We talked about love, Kimberly. What about you? 
Well, you had the love. What brought you here? You know, honestly, my um, my introduction to art started in the sixth grade when I was um, enrolled in a six through twelve uh, art school. It was called it's well, it's it's called Durham School of the Arts in Durham, North Carolina, and we each uh, moving up you know grades you had to um select a area of focus so my area of focus was sculpture and um piano and dance <laughs> so i've always kind of been in the arts and then in my undergraduate i studied visual art and um when i was taking steps towards you know creating a career um i decided to seek out an internship at a local um, artist residency center. It was a nonprofit and basically, um, an artist residency center is where artists can come. They are sometimes grant funded, private funding, state funding, whatever it might be. And they're invited to, uh, create work for a certain amount of time. And so I interned there and I just fell in love with meeting artists and, and really engaging with their artwork and watching their practice. And so then I, um, you know, I took that and I came to New York coming from North Carolina. I moved to New York. I, I, um, you know, got my dream job at the time, which was running an art gallery in, in Chelsea and, and being in that whole commercial art world and, um, until it wasn't so much of a dream for me personally. And so then that's when I decided to transition into archives, which, um, there's a lot of parallel between the commercial art world and archival collections. Um, stewardship and preservation and, and all of those things. So that's kind of how I arrived um, here. But, uh, you know, honestly, any suggestion I have is is to, you know, visit your local art museums, your local art galleries, get involved if they have volunteer programs or, you know, see, get get your feet wet doing, doing all the things um, to see, you know, what your area of focus might be, what might interest you in the art world and, and kind of finding your niche um, from there. Tammy, you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I came through the back door, actually. I always loved libraries. Back in. <laughs> because I didn't, I, I didn't major in art, but I always loved art. Um, and um, I actually um, grew up with people who made art. Um, my neighbor was a musician and he played music all day, every day. And a few doors down from him um, um, was another musician who also painted, who also knew Romeo Bearden. So um, um, I always was interested in art. Anytime I was in school, I was a literature major, but all my, um, my minor classes were, um, were art, art history classes. And um, actually, when I was in an undergrad, uh, my professor, Quincy Troop, um, um, assigned a paper. He said, go up to the Schomburg Center because you get your information. And this was like in 1983 or something, Kimberly. And um, <laughs> he's like, what? That ain't right. Um, so when I, I wasn't born Schomburg, yet. I was like, I could not believe <gasps> that there was a whole entire library devoted to black culture. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I got to work here. In the meantime, I did start working at a New York public library, but a branch library in Staten Island. And, um, but I always had my eye on the Schomburg center and in art and artifacts, but being that, um, what ended up happening was, is that Back then, a lot of the curators came out of the museum world, but we are a research library and we just, uh, it's adjacent, but it's not the same thing. And the art curators could not quite understand um, how we operated. But my boss, who came from the Studio Museum in Harlem, needed somebody who had that type of uh, know how, and that's how I got the job. Um, and then I went and, um, when my kids got old, I went back to school and, um, got my master's degree. So actually Kimberly and I are librarians, um, or knowledge managers, but with, um, the art background, um, coupled together. 
So tell me, are y'all, since Kimberly and Tammy y'all are librarians, are y'all really good at telling people to shush? I <laughs> am. <laughs> Kimberly's not. I'm, I I'm am. the one talking. I'm, I'm literally the one talking. <laughs> I'm being shushed. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this has been such a good conversation, yeah. but we have to start wrapping up now. So there's two mm -hmm. things I want to do before we wrap up. One, Bridget said hi, ladies, like <laughs> uh, an hour ago, but we were so good in the conversation we could <laughs> we couldn't break out. So from Ghana, say hi, Bridget. Is she, hey, from Ghana. Hey, <laughs> we're just gonna hi. give her some love. Hi, Bridget. We see you, sweetheart, and we appreciate you participating in the chat. Um, I think oh, that, over there. <laughs> I think that the the knowledge managers uh, got us together. Uh, Deirdre got us together, but we are about to go. So you know what? I my last question is this: What is like? First of all, you can shout out anything that you have. Like you have something upcoming that you want us to know about. Make sure that you shout it, shout yourself out. Give yourself your flowers, right? And then, what's one surprising thing that you found from looking at arts and artifacts? Something surprise that has surprised you. I don't know. Well, Deirdre, you want to start with us? Oh no, Tammy, go not ahead. So go surprising, ahead. but that's beautiful. Um, about Africans. When I tell you, okay, first of all, we call it art. For Africans, it's just um they're just utilitarian objects. But when I tell you decorating. And just the beauty. I have a um a, um what do you call it? Oh man. Oh, I can't think of what it is. It's an object. I, don't, I, I would have to describe it, but then it'd get nasty. But if you know when you're constipated and you have to uh what do you call those things? Um an enema, enema a right. A beautiful enema. Made pre 20th century, pre colonial Zaire. Wow. When I tell you beautiful, mm -hmm. of wood, and even today, when Deirdre came with her class, I had a family tree made from mm -hmm. African black wood um, mm -hmm. um, and pingo wood. Mm -hmm. One huge chunk of wood, like eight feet tall, and just chiseled with not, nothing electronic, nothing plugged wow. in, just uh, eight feet tall mm -hmm. with each layer had a different family dynamic, had about 25 different people, right, Deirdre? Yeah. On each yeah. Layer. And you can see yeah. it's a piece of wood. Yeah. yeah. So that black ingenuity. Magic. Uh, yeah. That mm -hmm. that's that's what Mr. Schomburg, that's why Mr. Schomburg put it together. Because he knew we were mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. And he wanted us mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Anything mm -hmm. you want to plug before we last pl last chance to plug? <laughs> She's like, I'm plugging. Um, I'm plugging. <laughs> well, one of the things one of the things I can plug is that um, the again the um, the publication of some of the archives that the the Bearden archives have been released and are, are online that you can see um, at the Wildenstein Platner Institute. And I would, I would love for people, I know that Tammy's gone up and she looked at some and she was able to identify um, someone in a photograph that was un, unidentified. Um, and this is the reason, this, this, is a, 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 this is a surprise. And also an answer to your question is all of these surprises because it's like puzzles and mysteries that you know get pieced together when you have a platform where you're putting all of these photographs and all of these images and then people go in and they make connections and that to me is you know the that's what art is about is making connections um, for us and so um, that's the biggest surprise for me is always when I see artists using other art and using other artists and been inspired by places and things that then teach us 20, 30 years later, um, things that we, we couldn't have experienced ourselves. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh, wait, and Deirdre, you can't go without telling us where you're speaking at. I believe you're 
You have a speaking engagement coming up? Oh, yes, it's a it's a small elementary school and and you probably can't come, but it's Longfellow Elementary in Columbia, Maryland. Um, and then I'm also giving a talk for Doctors Without Borders, which is something, you know, I, I didn't know anything about that organization, but they called me to come and talk to their employees about African-American art. So um, I love those opportunities because I love to talk. So we, we can't crash promoting. either one of them. <laughs> yeah, no, this is it for you. You got a good slide, Presenta. You, got, you, had, you had us for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But that, oh, well, but thank that you. Part of what Kimberly, I what about you? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Kimberly, what about you? Uh, what surprised you and anything you want to promote? Um, well, it surprised me. I don't have anything specific that surprised me. I will say, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just randomly, I could share it. One of my favorite artists of all time is Barkley Hendrix. Oh. Um, and uh, I remember being in high school and the Nasher Museum at Duke University put on a show called The Birth of Cool, I think it was, mm. it was called. Mm. Oh my God, I went and saw this exhibition 10 times. I made my parents go, made my brother go, all my friends go. And, um, and you know, I, I just, walking through this exhibition, these huge portraits of beautiful black people and black and brown people in incredible outfits and, and just the whole thing. It was just mm. an incredible show. Um, so if you want to see some good work, Google Barkley Hendrix <laughs> on top of all the other artists we've already mentioned. Um, and then uh, shameless plug, I have a book coming out on March 7th. It's entitled Dear Yesteryear. Mm -hmm. And it is based on an Instagram project that I started in 2020 called at Emmeline and them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it is basically um, photographs of everyday black Americans from the late 1800s and early 1900s that I share on Instagram. And um, so I am sort of Cre I've created a version of that in a picture book and um, I've written a poetic letter addressed to the ancestors and to the subjects in these photographs. And so, um, yes, again, it's called Dear Yesteryear. It's being published by Penguin Random House on March 7th. Congratulations. So, thanks. I'm very excited about that. Um, I would go run and get a copy, but uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Um, but yeah. Okay, you run it. No, you run and get a copy while I start doing the the wrap up and the thank yous because we want to. All right. Come on. Come on. All right. <laughs> you run and get it. Um, well, we've just been having a good full meal here. I know for a fact that our uh, panelists have fed us good, and you have asked such great questions. Thank you for your participation. I want to thank each of our panelists for joining us. Uh, and thank you all who have joined us um, in the comments and sharing your thoughts all the way from Ghana, right? <laughs> um, uh, please join us next time for Step by Step, Walking Our Way to Health on March 15th at seven, from 7 to 8.45. And also continue to join us for the weekly walks for wellness every Sunday at 7.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pieces Collective weekly walk is to strengthen the community and support our commitment to health and well-being. Now, is that do you got it? Do we want to see it? Love it. Yes. Oh, so nice. it's photographs of, of everyday Black Americans, late 1800s, early 1900s. Yes. Um, and uh, and it it's good. beautiful. Thank yes. you. Yeah. So it's oh, wow. I've written a letter to the ancestors, and that's what's sort of underpinning the photographs in the book. Oh, so. Wow. Penguin Random House. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. We're doing black excellence, all this, all yes, this. All we are. This. <laughs> we oh, try. <laughs> well, I hate to close this conversation, but I am. So for more information um, on our fabulous panelists, on these initiatives that are going on at the Pieces Collective, make sure you go to thepiececollective.org and subscribe. And again, thank you to our panelists for their insights. Thank you to Akrama Muhammad and Karen Freeman for gathering us together through the Pieces Collective. And we will see you next time. So good night. Mm -hmm.